Why didn't I ask you the question? <laughs> <laughs> Why did Narsim Avatar manifest? Radha, the little boy, invoked Lord Narsimha, invoked Vishnu. Vishnu has to take the form of Narsimha. Because Hiranya Kashpu had a boon. And the boon was that you can't kill him during the day or the night. So it was twilight. You can't kill him outside or inside. So that was on threshold. Space or earth. So he had him on his lap in between. Okay. Man or animal. Half animal, half man. This is the boon he took. But what is that he did? What was the atrocity he did for which uh, he was to be killed? This is the boon. But what, what did he do? Punished faith. Hmm? He punished people for having faith. He punished people for having faith. Yeah. He proclaimed himself God. Mm -hmm. that, that isn't wrong because it's all of us are divine. <laughs> so that need not be. Uh, wasn't he one of the Santakumaras who refused entrance to Vishnu's, uh, who refused entrance to Brahma uh, or somebody and he was cursed and then Vishnu lessened the curse that he will be, the two Santakumaras will be given two, three births in which Vishnu himself would kill them. And that's how they will get Mukti. Mm. For the love of the one devotee. Dictatorship. No? Dictatorship. Hmm. Dictatorship. See, I am divine is anybody's claim. But if I say I am alone divine, that is not. So he claimed, I am alone divine, I am alone God. And if you seek any other God, you would be killed. And that was the worst kind of a rule he had, where he demanded everybody to worship him alone and reject any other <coughs> form of worship. So you understand, here is here is a action performed by Hiranya Kashpu of the highest fanatical order. That's the height of fanaticism, where you can't worship anybody and you have to worship me alone. Re rejecting the many and uh, swearing by one would create conflict, would create fanaticism. So even if they are in a condition where you can't kill somebody from outside or inside, threshold, Daytime or night, you know, to light, you fulfilled all conditions, half animal, half man, but has to take a form of that kind to do that act. So, world should not have such fanatics. Now that's the very, very absolutely fanatic, where a person swears only by himself, I am alone God, if you worship anyone else, I'll put you into trouble. That is not correct. I think in the coming times, we should slowly start celebrating once again Narsimha Vata. Narsimha Where we have respect for multiple forms of worship. Every other form is accepted, every other form is respected. That's what the Hindu culture is. Hindu culture, because that was against the basic tenets of Hinduism. Hinduism accepts every path as valid. He doesn't swear by one path and reject. So here was a man who came and was trying to reject every other path and say he alone has to be worshipped, him alone as God. So when there is a kind of fanatism of this kind, the Lord manifests and takes him away. So for us, this avatar is important. That the manifestation of divine 
to take away fanaticism is Narasimhavan. And who was tortured for refuting, rebelling against him? His own child, Prada. A child was tortured. So this is important. I think in our Balbihar classes and all that, we should start bringing up and show Hiranyakashpu as a symbol of fanaticism. Because nobody has a right to reject other worship. We can worship God in thousand forms. Because for us the manifested and the manifested is the expression of the divine only. So how it can be that you reject the rest and accept one? I think this is a very good avatar to discuss in our Balviyar class, etc.
रामकृष्ण परमाणु से फॉर इन दैबिट इज गोइंग इन टू ट्रांस just like that in home to pass you sing a bhajan and the he will go you know, take his hand stand up and you know, i mean you see his pictures that way just a bhajan the name of mother kali is sufficient for him to go into trance so imagine ram krishna paramahamsa sitting here okay and we are all sitting down to listen to him someone sang a song and bhajan and he went to trance so what do you do when he goes to trance <laughs> you only can see him we are far away from getting into trance so and when will a person come down descend back it's not in our kavi you know like you are lost in uh, sleep itself we are worried whether to wake up a person or <laughs> samadhi into trance no way so he would go off and so people will not know what to do so then he would know few minutes before he gets sucked into trance few seconds before and he would tell people hey it's happening it's happening you know like <laughs> i could see it coming it slowly takes him off you know like probably you lose the body consciousness you know it spreads and loss and loss so probably a part of his body would have already you would have lost into you know so only something visible so he would say hey, hey it's happening it's happening because people can't you know so they would take rasagulla <laughs> rasagulla and put it in his mouth say no eat 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 so become body conscious you know do <laughs> don't go into samadhi we have all come here this is what they used to do they and when he knows that it is happening it's like a child so immediately they are given something to eat taking water and sprinkling with water you know so prasad was there you, know, you eat something so they were feeding rasagulla to him not to go into samadhi <laughs> now person of that kind whatever he does will be graceful after him he had a disciple by name mahendra he has written that book in the gospel of ramakrishna the gospel of ramakrishna is a beautiful collection made by this person mahendra daily incident somebody came how ramakrishna responded you know whenever he was around he used to notice it and came one day he was watching ramakrishna paramahamsa folding a shawl you know the shawl you wear it on top he was just folding it up holding a shawl was so graceful watching it mahendra nath went into samadhi <laughs> guru then talks about it in one of the gita so uh, commentary one of the so verses he mentions about this watching him fold a shawl the disciple goes into samadhi what it must be is just an action the question is aprame you know like how do you measure this action mm. how graceful he must have done it it would have been like a art how you perform an art that way he was folding watching that this guy went into samadhi how deeply we are involved in an action and in that action when it is done without any doership you are not the doer he is the doer you know it's not a statement of modest it is not being modest you are saying he is the doer it is a statement of fact when we realize i am not the doer he is the doer there is no doership and an action is performed 
it will be immeasurable. Watching it, people can go into some of it. How can we practice Vairagya without compromising compassion? How can we be sure we are following us? How can we practice Vairagya without compromising compassion? What is right? What is dharma must be performed? What is dharma must be performed? So what is dharma we must do? We can't bring in compassion towards someone not doing dharma. So you can't. So you can't say I'll be compassionate to someone not following dharma. That is wrong, that is not Dharma. Showing compassion to a person who is not practicing Dharma is wrong. Mm -hmm. Then Ram has to be compassionate to Ram. Isn't it? Ram tried. He sent Hanuman, he sent Angar. He sent people to talk to Ravan. Ravan was not ready to listen. Now why can't Ram be compassionate? So where do you draw line? Ravan was pleading to Sita to heal. Compassionate? Not allowed. You understand? Where it comes to Dharma, you should know to follow Dharma. So Ram tried talking to him, that was his compassion. He spoke to Ravan, sent word, Ravan did not listen. Sent again on reaching Lanka, he sent Angad to go and talk to him. That time also he did not listen. Gave him an opportunity to, uh, to change, to resolve, to become better, you know. He did not. Since he did not change, he has to take action. He took action. But Ram's compassion you can see because the time, at that time, when you win a kingdom, you make that kingdom under your kingdom. You, you know, like the kingdom you win is annexed to your kingdom and you put your flag up there. <coughs> Ram did not do that. That is compassion. He called Vibhishan, son of the soil, whose native, he was the native of that land, a prince by birth gave him the kingdom who is the right person and he said I am least interested in your kingdom you keep it you all rule I have not come here to rule Lanka I have not come here to annex Lanka under Ayodhya what would have been Ram's glory just think had he extended his kingdom a banished prince when he returns back he has actually expanded his kingdom would have been a different kind of a glory. But he did not do all that. He said, no, this, I don't need this. That is compassion. Yes, he said, why do I need this? Though he got it dharmically, he said, no. So compassion is something which we should practice, but not at the cost of dharma. So when we have to do it, give a chance to reform to refine, give a chance, once, twice. If that's not working out, what is dharma must be practiced. So, if you are going to develop, I mean, here the question is, how can we practice vairagya without compromising uh, compassion? Vairagya is detachment. Krishna had detachment for everybody, including the Pandavas. He was with them, but he was detached. So that vairagya which comes from him is by clearly understanding what is dharma. 
And when we understand dharma and we are very clear about it, vairagya happens very easily. You know, this is dharma and I do it. So if we understand dharma well, we know what is to be done and uh, detachment will come naturally from it. Here what happens, when I am attached to something, I would, no, no, it's it. I am okay. I, uh, it was the same. What happens here is, uh, when I am attached to something, I will compromise. Why did I give a lot of money? When I am attached, I like doing what I like, not what is right. Rules change, isn't it? If someone whom you are attached, oh, forgiveness is so much. <laughs> <laughs> and someone whom you don't like, imagine, all the rule books come into play. <laughs> so when we are attached, we will compromise. So how can we practice Vairagya? I must practice Vairagya, you know, by understanding that. Then I need to take action, whatever I have to take, I'll take. How can we be sure we are following a swadharma and not our ego? The word swadharma, you know, dharma in that word is more important. Swadharma, your own dharma. Nobody can point what is your swadharma. You have to find it. This is one of the things. It can't be pointed out by anybody. We only have to find it. it. Path can be indicated. An indication, we can indicate here and there how to search for Swadharma. Uh, but finding has to be absolutely individual, everyone. What are the things you like doing? And you think you will like doing it for next uh, 25 years. That is one you can think of. What are the things which will keep you inspired? Now and next 25 years from now. Like let us say simple. Guru. <coughs> Guru there. He taught Gita in 1951. He's very inspired in 1993 also to teach Gita. 42 years he was always inspired doing it. So he was very clear sharing this knowledge is something he felt is important and he found happiness doing it. So we must be very clear what are the things which will keep me inspired doing it again in the next probably 20 years from now? That is one area to look into. And you also must look that which you think you will be inspired doing for 20 years. How much of it you felt in the past? How deep impact it had, in, had on you? Or something similar to it, close to it as a child? What's that urge there? As a youth, teenager, was that urge there? So when we start analyzing, ah, this is what I feel like doing, the most fascinating thing, okay. Was this urge there or something similar to it? Was it there? In my childhood, in my youth, when I become aware of them, yeah, then I can know there are certain similarities. Listing down those similarities, and choosing a way of life to spend the rest of your life in those similarities could be close to Swadharma. This is the only way one can try. Because it's basically the things which you do, you stay inspired. Every time you go out and perform, you're very inspired. So you're very, very 
uh, happy doing it, very enthusiastic doing it, never tired. It has got nothing to do with your uh, recognition. It has got nothing to do with your uh, wealth. Or nothing to do with that. It is something you feel. Read this book sometime. Andrew Agassi's book, Open. He has written. Whoever has given him the title is a very intelligent title. That is. Open. Keep an open mind. Open. Australian open. <laughs> US open. Yes. Open. So the book is called Open. And the first chapter in the book is called The End. <laughs> <laughs> the End. That was where it was really stunning to know. And honesty of Andrew Agassi. He said, uh, I didn't like tennis. I'm playing my last season. This is my last season. In two months time, I'll sh shut down. I'm retiring from tennis. I played tennis for my living. Forced by my father mm -hmm. when I was a kid. He gave <laughs> me the racket and asked me to hit the ball. And I went on doing it for hours together. I did not like. It is the end of the agony of being a tennis player. First chapter, the end. Now, to everyone else who would have sweared, oh, that must be his uh, Iswadharma, you know, he must have felt for it and won, won number one, number one seated he was. And brilliant tennis player, you know. He said, I like playing. I want to be done with it. And this is the last season, the end. The end of the agony. The nightmare is coming to an end. Him in this biography. So you can choose something and play 20 years. Go into it 20, 25 years. I'm not happy doing it. So it's got nothing to do with recognition. It's got nothing to do with the success. In the eyes of the world, nothing. How many people were like that? Tyagaraja. The singer Tyagaraja. The king called and said, Write something about me. My glory, right? He said, I am inspired to write about him, and I will not give. Living in poverty, he has to go into the roads and ask food and live. Or the king would have given him a palace, made him a court poet. He said, no, I want that. I am happy doing this. That is against my will. I will not do it. I write, my poetry inspires me, and I will write about him. Subramanya Bharat. Ettaya Paraman village, where the king called him and said, you write. You will keep, I'll keep you in my court. You become my court poet. All these people are living in absolute poverty. Complete poverty. There was not enough food for them to eat at home. The king is offering. He said, no, I will not. The poem, poetry which comes to me, I respect the poetry and I enjoy reveling in it. I cannot sing for you. On you. No compliments. So, Swadharma is that. It has got nothing to do with your surrounding. It has got nothing to do how well known you are. It has got nothing to do how much money you have made out of it. It's got to do with everything. How happy are you doing it? How inspired are you doing it? Are you inspired about it? What is the level of inspiration you have? Then that would that would keep in, in various ways. So we need to seek swadharma that way. That's why the word dharma in in swadharma is more important. Swa is secondary. Dharma there is more important. It should have uh, that liking.
How do you accept rejection and failure, whether it is related to a person or a situation? One thing is for sure, nobody on earth gets everything they want. Nobody gets. That is against the principles of law of karma. I go get everything I want, that means there, there is no question of anything else. Nobody gets it. Everybody will have certain things denied in life. Because the life is made to go that way. That's where the karma comes in. Joy, sorrow, happy, sad. It is designed that way. Victory, defeat, pleasant, unpleasant, comfort, discomfort. We keep moving. So law of karma Will, will bring both in human life. Because that's the best way to go through life. Just one. Only happiness, people will commit suicide. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Only sadness, people will commit suicide. Both. It has to have a balance. Karma is made that way. It balances always. So no one would ever get everything they want. There will be something you get, something would be denied. It can be person, it can be issues, it can be various things. Now, we need to understand that these things can happen. What is my response to such things is more important. How do I respond to a failure? How do I respond to rejection? How do I respond to disappointment? How do I respond to betrayal? Is more important. Incidents will happen. Everybody will have all this. Something or other you will get, something or other you will be rejected. Something, I mean, it goes on. Isn't it? Different factors we will find ourselves incompetent or less compared to others. In some you could be very strong, in some you could be very ordinary. And when we move in the world, we will just see someone else could be better than me on some aspects. So it, it is bound to happen 
that there would be things which I really like and I get it and there would be things which I really want but I may not get it. So option here is how to avoid is not the option because it will happen again. How to avoid that I don't get uh, disappointed again, no. It will happen. How to avoid rejection in life, sorry, it will happen. It can be a situation, it can be a person, it can be hundreds of things, same thing will happen. How do I respond when it happens? That is in my control. Someone rejecting you is not in your control. It is in the other person's control. You offer something and the other person says no. To say no is, is not in your control. We may try different methods to get that yes from someone, but it may not work. The other person has all the right to say no. So what we need to know is, whether it is a situation or a person, these things will continue to happen. Only option is develop strength to deal with it. It should not be an issue which can shatter you now. It should not be an issue. Can we avoid death? Can you avoid death of people around you? You may wish that I would like to go before others, you know, the people I'm attached to and all that. You may wish, but that may not be. So it will happen. You understand, when we live long enough, people around us whom you love can die. How I respond to that is more important. If you have to even miss somebody, miss them from strength not from helplessness. This is important. If I am missing someone, let me miss that person from strength. If a failure has come, let me take the failure with strength. Not that a failure should shatter me that I am gone. I am done. I am now there is no end to me. I mean, you know, like, there's no, it's the dead end. No, it's not. It is not the dead end. It happened. Yes, move on. How much you operate with strength is important than what failures you face. Failure is bound to happen to everybody. Everybody will get something or other. But we must have the strength to see it. That strength comes only from spiritual study novels. Or topics taken from spiritual studies presented in different manners. But the theme is the same. That is spirituality. There are people who have taken the spiritual wealth and learned a very different method of teaching it, but it is a methodology which is different. Content is the same. So it is this strength you need which comes from spirituality. Arjuna was shattered. Krishna gave him knowledge. Arjuna became strong. He got back his strength everywhere. So this strength through study, japa, puja, regular satsang will give us the strength. Life of great people, how they responded to various situations, all that can be very inspiring. How did Vivekananda respond to poverty? How did Vivekananda respond to affluence? Abundance when it came, how he responded? There was a time they want to build a samadhi for their master, Vivekananda, and a group of disciples. And they did not have money to build a samadhi for Ramakrishna Paramahansa. Mm. So they used to carry his urns in a pot and keep it in different, different houses. You keep it because there's puja has to be done, so you keep it for a few days. Can you imagine Ramakrishna Mission, which is a global organization, multinational? There was a time for that organization 
inspired by Ramakrishna. He did not have an organization. He was just a, doing puja and dakshineshwar. Vivekananda built this organization. But the person who inspired them, for him they did not find a space to keep the urns. They will take it into different families and keep. See, how they responded at that time? Say, someday money will come. We will do it. Till then, let's go. But they were very clear that it can't be a small uh, shack as a samadhi. It has to be a grandeur because the world has to know about it. They were very clear about it. A bunch of young disciples were 100% clear that we must keep it in such a way that the world remembers him, the world inspires him, people will come and see. Let us do it that way. Till we get there, we will move like this. So when you had nothing, when you have to carry your Guru's arms, what it must have been. And the same, when it started coming in abundance, how did they respond? Vivekananda built this organization called Ramakrishna. There are interesting facets about him. He made somebody else the president of the organization. He started it, I mean, you know, he brought people and those senior disciples who were around, there was no organization. Vivekananda could have done it on his own name and could have continued or, you know, things like that. He could have been the absolute authority he did too. He said, these are the other disciples who were inspired by Ramakrishna. So he made them their president. And if any amount has to be passed, even if Vivekananda needed some money for something, he'll go to them. He would have raised the whole money. <laughs> give it to them. And that person would feel, yeah, I sign and give it to you. I mean, look at it. In abundance, how he responded. Now when we have how these people responded at difficult times and how they responded when they were mighty successful, how they responded can be a great inspiration. How they responded at failures, how they responded to glory can be great. So when we start looking at such incidents, such responses of great people, we may also develop strength, spirituality and lives of great people can give us better way to respond. That can de develop strength. Then we can deal with it. So, difficulties, all this is bound to happen. It is, it, is, it is for everybody. There's not one person who will not have faced uh, all this. But how we respond further to all this is important. What is true forgiveness? True forgiveness? Don't forgive a person for too long. <laughs> true forgiveness. We are going to destroy him or her if you keep forgiving. You understand? Oh, you made a mistake. Oh. You are extremely dear to me, I forgive you. Or oh, second time you made a mistake? Not time. Even Krishna could not accept forever, isn't it? Over Shishupala. He said, okay, I give him some space. Hundred maybe, okay. Not more. Great. That is extreme case. You don't have to wait hundred chances. <laughs> <laughs> Forgiveness. should be back. See, I tell you, the, most of this comes from grasping what is dharma. That's, that's where we need to become clear. What is dharma? Dharma is not easy to grasp. A lot of study, reflection is needed. We have to spend time and leisure and solitude to understand. Because what is right and wrong is getting into extreme difficult today. What judiciary says as right, is right. It need not be dharma. You understand? 
judiciary may say something as right, but that need not be ethical from religion standpoint. Because the judge who is giving it, he is not a religious person. So he may say, you understand. So we need to understand what is dharma. It gets more complex nowadays. Because there is a judiciary version of it also. The government, the constitution can say something legal. It may not be dharma. So we need to understand. So dharma gets into complex. Only suggestion which is practical, which we can see is when you have a doubt on a particular thing, whether it is dharmic or not, meet people of authority, people of vision. In your mind, you think this person is capable of giving you right advice, consult, whom you see as someone who can guide you correctly, concern. Taking an opinion that way would be helpful in understanding dharma, otherwise we will not, we may not. Deep study and reflection is needed to know it. Once we know deep study and reflection, we know very clearly this is dharma, this is not dharma. Because there we will look at what is right in the long run and what is beneficial. Today, if we take a topic like Rama going to the forest, right or wrong, we can debate all day, right? If Dashrath gave a boon to Kaikeyi and Kaikeyi has quashed the boon at the time, now Rama has to take a call whether he has to go to the forest or not. Going to the forest is right. We can debate this way. No, what he went, he went to the forest is right. No, he should not have gone to the forest. We can produce papers arguing Rama should have stayed by. Now, to, now how do you take a call on it? What is right? Going to the forest is right or staying back in the palace is right? In today's understanding, isn't it? A part of you still says that, correct? Rama could have stayed back also. Why did he go? What is right? He walked to the forest, that was right. It's not a personal call he made. He took a stand which he considered as dharma in understanding dharma. So I, I always ask this question, which 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 uh, makes us think more. If Kaikeyi wanted Bharat to rule, right? If Bharat was like Duryodhana, if Bharat was like Duryodhana, <coughs> would Ram go to the forest? <laughs> Because Bharat was not like that, so everybody is easily saying, I'm asking, what is the difference there? He obeyed Kaikeyi, he obeyed his father, because the choice was also correct. You understand? When they picked up Bharat, he said, kingdom is safe. It is not a loss to the nation. Bharat will do his job well. I can go. If Bharat was not capable, was not competent, would Rama take a call on this is completely different. Because you can't give up the nation for an individual. The higher cannot be given away for lower whims and fancies. The lower when you give up for the higher, we call it sacrifice, that is Dharma. My personal name. 
My father is helpless, poor man. He did so much for me. He loved me. And he is helpless. He gave a word. I will honor that word. Go into the forest. My father is far higher too. Then my personal power position, name, fame, from a what? But, is that a compromise on the country? Yes, if Bharat was bad. Bharat was not bad. So Bharat was equally good. And when Ram comes back after 14 years, Bharat takes him around and shows, you see our cattle, we have multiplied it 10 times more. Then when Dasharath gave it to me, now when I'm handing it over, it is multiplied 10 times more. Our cattle wealth, our gold, every other thing, Bharat multiplied it 10 times more and that's how we handed it to Ram. Now you see the competent king. So Ram knew, so Bharat is competent and therefore he walked. If Bharat is not competent and Ram alone was competent at that time, Ram should not give up the country for a person. So Dharma. So Dharma is a very, very debatable. And I'll tell you one way to understand this. Wherever you find in our books, Mahabharata, Ramayana, these two I'll tell you, these two. In these two books, wherever you find something controversial, but the author, Vyasa or Valmiki, has taken a stand, you must understand that stand is right. How you arrive on it is your evolution. Ram and Wali. Ram shot Wali hiding behind a tree. Is that a good sign of a warrior? That you hide behind a tree and you kill someone? Wali did not even know. The arrow came from a, from behind a tree. Is that correct? Valmiki points out and Ram shoots Wali from behind a tree. Ram is not wrong. Not because he is Ram. That action is not wrong. Now, how you justify that? How you understand it would help you to develop depth in Dharma. Every action of that character who is shown as divine, if there is a contradiction and yet the person took a stand of this, how that stand is right, you must reflect on it and arrive. I'll, I'll put you questions. <laughs> how was Karna killed? All that taken away, finally. You understand, he was trying to move the chariot. He was not even on a chariot. He was down on the floor. He was down on the floor, no weapon, trying to remove the wheel. Krishna tells, I was going to shoot him. Shoot him? How difficult it must have been for Arjuna. Arjuna says, come on, it is impossible, I can't do this. It is against all laws what I have read. I mean, this is not acceptable. Just do it. This is right, you do it. Go ahead and do it. Shoot it, there's nothing wrong with that. Cutting a string of a teenage warrior, cutting the string of his bow from the back of a teenage warrior is also no honor to any warrior. Karna did that to Abhiman. Abhiman, you fighting and he cut the string from the back? Is that any glory? Don't waste time on all the finishing. And Arjuna went. 
So when Krishna is asking Arjuna to do, you should understand. No, no, no. We should give him forgiveness. <laughs> Until you take all these issues which are contradicting, keep them for your class mm. discussion. List it down. All controversial issues which you find is not correct. The manifestation of divine walking on this earth we say as committed uh, action of this kind. It is very natural for us to say that is not correct. That is, that is very ordinary. To see how that is correct is your maturity. Because dharma is extremely tricky and complicated. If you can see how they are right, you get the point. We are working on this book, but uh, let us see how, how quickly we can bring it up. Ramakrishna and me are working on this. So I have told him, list down all such issues, list it down. And we will see and tell people how to read these books. When a situation like this comes, how do you need to read it? So we will write a note on it. That may take time. Both of us have to be a little free to do it. But meanwhile, this can be a good discussion where you find Rama or Krishna's action questionable, debatable, take it up and see how they are right. If that is not right, Valmiki and Vyasa can avoid it. Why should they write? Why should Valmiki write it? Isn't it? When you write a book, na, most debatable, controversy, remove, remove. <laughs> you know, when we write a play, we do all that. It's a very tricky topic. You know, Valmiki could have avoided all that and then glorified Ram. He showed us Ram's glory is he took a stand of this kind, which is right. And he was not scared of what people are going to say. And he took a stand because that was that way. Krishna took a stand. It doesn't matter what people are going to say. He took a stand which is right. Was bold enough to take. And that is the position they have kept them. So you need to see it from that perspective. Now coming back to the question of forgiveness. Unless we understand dharma correctly, we won't know, you know, like uh, how much to forgive and how long to forgive, when not to forgive, we should be clear. You can't keep forgiving someone forever. You are not helping that person to grow. You are making that person uh, weak. So you must forgive. Forgiveness is important. You should not keep the grudge. You must forgive people. Your mind should become free. But if someone is not ready to learn your large heartedness, etc., and if that crime or the action what they are taking is quite severe, then you also need to take action. You cannot allow yourself to be cheated again and again. And if it is definitely hurting you, you should know. So forgiveness is something which you can forgive once, twice. Then you need to take a call case to case. It can't be general, we can't say. Can I keep forgiving people forever? Then you're never helping the other person to do. No, but I like to forgive. It depends upon what level of uh, issues you're forgiving. If someone is not doing right things and it, that is going to destroy the person in the long run, and you can be party to it by forgiving that person. Hmm. This is a nice joke. A man was working for wages and once he finished, you know, a tea estate, let us say. They all of them are in the queue and they go collect their wages. So one day the manager gave him double than what he deserves. He said, the other day I gave you more. You never said anything. <laughs> Today you are asking, that day I gave you more? He said, listen, I can forgive you once, not forever. <laughs> <laughs> once I can forgive you, you are making the same mistake again. 
<laughs> so you should know where to forgive, <laughs> when to pull back, because doing right action is important. How does one improve focus on every task they, do, they perform? Start with Japa daily. This is powerful, do it with Japa. In fact, every other religion has taken this practice of Hinduism into their systems. Hinduism, the oldest religion, emphasized on Japa. Buddhism which came from Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism, all took to Japa. Abrahamic religions also took to Japa. So everybody does, you know, they move the rosary, the beads, the rattle, various things people adopt, but it is all Japa. Japa helps the mind and body come together. When you do japa regularly, you, you are bringing your body, mind together, you come to the present. You live here. Physically, mentally, we are in the same place. Whenever we are physically, mentally, we are on the same place, we are very focused. So how to improve my focus? First point, everyday japa. Second point, List down something very, very simple. List down five activities you do daily. Five activities, minimum. This five will slowly become more and more. We don't have to bother about it because it will, by naturally, it will become more. But you identify five activities you do, your daily activities, five of them. And whenever you are doing these five do it with absolute focus. It could be sipping a glass of water. Every time when you sip water, do it with absolute focus. As if you are being examined, watched. When you have to do something, Let's say in the game of gymnastics, when you go and when you have to perform, every move what you do has a point, isn't it? How you go and stand there, how you leap, how you take off, how you land. And when you are, let us say, a somersault or you are on the Roman reins or on the horse, whatever you do, everything is watched, everything is calculated, analyzed, everything is examined. And then you finish the action. The whole thing is done with absolute focus. Because every moment of it was being examined. Similarly, it can be drinking a glass of water, but do it with absolute focus. How will you do it when you are being examined? That way. Five activities when we start doing it with complete focus. Slowly refocusing becomes a habit. This 5 will become 25 in a year's time. You have got your focus. Physically, mentally, you come back to the same place. So one is Japa. Second is identify 5 activities. Start doing these 5 with absolute focus. You will gain the gain by the ability. Can you explain the three avatars and their interpretation that you discussed on day one? See, Matsya avatar, I told you, is for knowledge. Lost Vedas, Vishnu went and brought it. So the focus there was, if we do not put effort to maintain hand over certain things which are lost would be really difficult to get it back. 
So this idea was brought out on the first one. Second avatar, the story is the tortoise, Vishnu took the form of a tortoise, where he said every other being has come together. All forces were brought together in search of immortality. So everybody was used to it. And when something like that is happening, and it was not going to be successful, Vishnu gave that help. So we know that if we can do something sincerely, there is a third factor called grace, Ishwara's intervention that happens. So Vishnu came there. Devas and Asura's effort was honored. Vishnu came there. And through that churning, they got different, different things from the earth, including goddess of prosperity. Lakshmi is also who has come there. Now, these are all highly symbolic. When you go on churning, when you go on doing churning within, churning together, discussion, ideas, a lot of things will come. Many of us don't churn together. Within we don't churn, collectively we don't churn. How many of us sat down and analyzed what is going wrong with Hinduism? Few people do it, right? Not all. What is wrong with this uh, particular policy? What is wrong? How many of us are churning? If we can do and churn, what is the solution? Why are youth losing interest in spirituality? Why are they going away from religion? How many of us sat and churn? When we sit and churn, a lot of things can come out. Solutions can come out. So the second avatar indicated, together all of us coming, bringing everybody together and the working. As a result, from the churning, a lot of things came. Good and the bad and all that. And the third avatar story was, how the earth got drowned. It's poetic. You might ask me why. In poetry, if you have to show earth drowned. In a painting, if you have to show earth drowned, how do you show? Water all over, then you can't see anything. So they show poetically earth itself as a ball has gone down. It's pure poetry. I told you the other day, our scriptures are written that way. We were the first to know that sun is in the center. Planets revolve around it. It is not sunrise and sunset. That is the best way to express it. But we all know it is sun is in the center and planets revolve around it. We have seen this in our Navagraha. And Navagraha is much, much before uh, uh, telescopes came into place. Much before Galileo, etc. We knew. And yet, poetically, we say the sun comes with seven horses. Measuring time, each horse is one day, seven days of the week. So we say sun rides with seven horses is absolutely poetry to convey a fact which is understood. Sun was in the center, but the time is much easily measured if you see sun movement. Because we don't see earth moving. So knowing pretty well, this is poetically described. Similarly, knowing pretty well, poetically described, the earth as a ball has gone down into the ocean. And that is Mother Earth. The wild boar brought it up. Now, it is to say that uh, if we don't pay attention to different things, and yesterday we saw that, that movie, Arctic is also melting. And what can happen? Coastal nations, you know, many of these areas can go down. Water levels can go up, go, and we can be in a position to destroy ourselves. So there are possibilities of that kind. At such times, a bigger force comes to lift it up. And that bigger force can come only through us, continuously, if we can work on it. So the earth in danger, brought back again, uplifted, is the third avatar. And if our actions are not well governed, this can happen. So these 
Avatars are not just stories. They are more than a story. And uh, what is more than a story? It can be more symbolic. It can be scientific. It can be poetic. How do I know what it is? What I told you is a broad outlook. If you really like it, you must take up to one of these avatars, study. Deep study, if you do, suddenly you will find a deeper meaning coming through. Now, for example, then let me tell you, if you go to some of the Hindu temples, at the doorway of the temple or in a pillar, you will find an elephant and a lion together. Body of a lion, trunk of an elephant in an animal. Where do you find such animals? Lion, body of a lion, and trunk of an elephant. On a temple entrance, they keep. Before you enter into the main Garbhagraha, or the pillars you will find. What does that mean? What was the person trying to say? Possible. Now there is one in astrology. There is a yoga, they call it Gaja Kesari Yoga. Gaja Kesari. Kesari lion, Gaja elephant combined, which indicates certain kinds of prosperity and all that. Maybe this man had that. The artist would have had this idea and he would have put possibility. I am only saying the possibility. So these are to be contemplated. You keep thinking about it, certain things can be revealed. For a long time, even I didn't understand, and one day this idea struck me. I do not know how uh, sure I am, but that looks quite close. Gaja Kesari. Possible. A particular kind of uh, um, benefits one will have in the horoscope if they say this and that. So it, maybe this is what he's trying to say. We don't know. So these are the books which we cannot read as a story from the intellectual level. These are the books you have to read from your intuition, which we don't know how to do. You understand? We don't know. It is. I think Aravindo who said it. He said it for the Upanishads, but definitely applicable for the Puranas. Definitely applicable for the Puranas. He said, don't read the books from your intellect, read it from your intuition. You read and then go deep into it and then see. Because they are written from a very different dimensions. So this is general outline what I told you. More if we have to see it, then we have to um, read, reflect. I remember there was one great Swamini in, in our mission. She is now no more. My name is Swamini Sharada Priyanam. Sharadama has come here also to United States. Some of you may know her. Sharada Priyananda from Andhra Pradesh living in Kadapa. She, is, she, she attained Samadhi some time back. I think 2000, yeah, 99 or 2000. She came to our ashram to take classes when we were studying as Brahmacharyas. And we knew, we knew that Amma has done a lot of study on uh, Puranas. So with little excitement we asked Amma, you can, can you take a Purana for us? He said, if I teach Purana, now you will only know the story. You read a few Upanishads. You read a few Upanishads, you will have a kind of a depth, then it will be more easy to discuss. This is the answer she gave when we said, if you want to know about Purana, she said, read a couple of Upanishads, <laughs> reflect. Then you will have that kind of a depth to understand a Purana. If I tell a Purana, now it will be only a story. So they are not just stories, they are much more deeper way of presenting. And they adopted that style. Now that is the most beautiful part of it. They adopted that style so that the students can dive deep and find it not making it very explanatory directly, making us to go deep, contemplate and find out. 
Gurudev used to say, always set a goal, which is not achievable. Always try to achieve higher goals. For common people, does it mean you set a progressive goal? Huh. You set a goal and you have progressive destinations. This is, at this time I would like to do it. Keep that practical. Goal should be very, very high. At which time, which to which extent you want to go, that should be well defined. If that's what you're asking as progressive. If the goal is set, you know, like this is how I would like to see each in mission. Okay. By 2022, how would you like to see it? By 2025, how would you like to see it? We should become clear. 20, 25, 75 years of Chennai Mission. We started in 1951. So 2020, uh, 2025, 2026, that one year would be 75th year. So we must keep it little, there should be something to strive for. Swamiji, where do you draw a line between love and moha, attachment? Attachment means my need is more important, it is selfish. Love, the other person is more important, not my need. In the attachment, my need, my pleasure, everything about me is important. When you love, it is not me, it is the other person who is more important. Attachment will have, a, you know, like a, aligned to selfishness. Love is aligned to selflessness. To love is difficult. To attach is very easy. To selfishness is there, we can get easily attached. Why do you love someone? Ah, that person makes me feel good. So, makes me feel good again. My interest is more. When you love, it doesn't matter whether the person responds to you, may not respond. You know what is good for that person, you will go out and. So, moha, attachment. Attachment operates from selfishness, love operates from selflessness. So, truth or right? <laughs> when is it important to correct a falsehood? What if the falsehood gives someone a comfort? You know, we discussed this dharma. Do what is dharma, understand what is dharma. You cannot love someone. Uh, to continue in falsehood, that means you are making that person not evolve, rather revolve around wrong action. That is not correct. The person should grow. So you should not. If there is a falsehood, you should... See, there is a method of inspiring. You should adopt a method where you can go inspire and take the person out. If it is direct, maybe they may not understand. So you should know how well you can... Go along with that and make that person turn away. So falsehood cannot be encouraged. Is there an end to the quest of knowledge? Can one reach nirvana only by doing bhakti and chanting? I get connected to the Almighty when I do this. Is there an end to the quest of knowledge? Seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, knowing which there is nothing left to be known. Hey Arjuna, I am giving you that knowledge. Knowing which there is nothing left to be known. So knowing that Supreme Self, I think quest for knowledge will end it. So there may not be much after that. As a quest for knowledge, because once you know that, there is nothing else is left to be known. You know everything. So, realizing the self is equal to ending of quest for knowledge. 
but what do you do with the knowledge once you have that access to the total knowledge what do you do many masters did a lot of things so not that after reaching that knowledge you sit quietly you share it you do it you bring it out to people inspire a lot of things for can one reach nirvana by doing bhakti and chanting yes you can it's a true path we have multiple paths we are just not one but somewhere each path will cross each other you know collect through somewhere we will be meeting so when you start with bhakti also you need knowledge when you start with bhakti definitely you need knowledge bhakti means what to love the lord you love the lord more when you know about the lord more to know about the lord more you need to know what the lord is so knowledge helps you to cultivate devotion and once you have the knowledge you want to know more so there's a love to know more bhakti comes there so they are complementary but uh, with the basics of knowing what god is and understanding what bhakti is both are important bhakti and chanting what you call as bhakti okay please verify that if bhagavad gita also calls that as bhakti <laughs> that you have to verify is narad rishi talking about it as bhakti in narad vakya sutra some of these books you need to verify <coughs> what you think as bhakti once that is in part definitely bhakti is a way chanting is definitely a way last question how do you free yourself from bondage in today's materialistic world does it take a life changing event to make this transformation how do you get yourself free from the bondage in today's materialistic world materialism is a phase it can't be something can inspire forever you can't inspire forever. go through a phase and then you know okay, this is not what so we need to understand that very very clearly that this can inspire us only for a while and no matter what we get on it where do we go next you know we have some of our books brahma sutra narada bhakti sutra you know these books starts with a word called athatho athatho in sanskrit means therefore or thereafter the first word of the book therefore how do you start a sentence and therefore mm. therefore is a conjunction you understand there is something therefore let us do it this is this 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 has happened therefore let us do this so therefore is a conjunction so athato when we say therefore that means all the masters like shankara in his commentary on brahma sutra goes on to write about it what does this word therefore mean i have seen this world i have seen enough of it i have gone through it therefore now let us discuss god you understand that therefore is is something which is important that we would have gone through this enough and more and how long can we go on with the same thing at some point of time we would get that kind of an inspiration to seek something far higher than what we are revolving around so that that is the materialistic uh, demands and when we are caught in it we are really caught we are stuck in it only way to wriggle out would be when you realize saying this is not working so best simple solution for this would be fix a time 15 years 
<laughs> 20 years. If I have to rot in materialism, I'll rot. But not more than that. <laughs> that is the time frame I give to get myself out of it. No, Swami, you will have another few years, 20 years. <laughs> you, it all depends. The 20 years you can't uh, only go in materialism. When you start now with spiritual knowledge and give a time span, I think you can. We had this uh, beautiful system earlier. The system only brought everybody into it. You were a student, Brahmacharya, life and self control, then Grahastha, go indulge in life, but Grahastha indulgence came with responsibility. Grahastha indulgence was with responsibility. Six, seven kids minimum. <laughs> no, that's nothing wrong. That's very important. Now, I'm glad this question, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at you, answering you. But you know, today, which is the nation in the world which has the youngest population? Yeah. India. 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 Hmm. India is the youngest nation. Young population maximum is in India. How? The grandparents, not the parents, grandparents. Most of them had five, six children. You check your own grandparents. At next generation, when the joint family system and all got, they started settling down to two or one kid. This has hurt the country. This has hurt China badly, this has hurt Japan badly. It is not affecting India now, but 20, 30 years from now it will affect. A young population should be more in a country than the elderly population. So the younger population takes care of the elderly population. You have that elderly level, it is a retirement kind of a life where you can't be productive to the world. Progress of the world and all that you can't. That's the time when you withdraw. So it is the young people who have to do it. So the young population should always be more. To have young population more by mathematical formula, you must have two and a half kids. <laughs> two and a half kids. So that is to say, you know, like uh, two parents, then you have two kids, then at some point it will become 50 50 person. You understand? So it should be more. That's why three, four, five, it was wisdom. And they knew that is the responsibility you take. So Grahastha Ashram came with wisdom and responsibility. And Grahastha Ashram has to take care of brahmacharis. They are young people. They have to be, you know, studied. So the maintenance of Grahastha Ashram, I mean, of brahmacharya was Grahasthas. Maintenance of Vanaprastha, when they are withdrawing, was a partly Grahastha. But Vanaprastha was in a position to take care. And from Vanaprastha Ashram, when you go to the next level, you graduate and go into sannyas, it was again Grahastha who to take care. So Grahastha Ashram had pleasure, indulgence, responsibility. It was created that way. How long? 20 years. Then you go into Vanaprastha, where you are withdrawing slowly. And from Vanaprastha, sannyas was compulsory. We are very clever to avoid all this. <laughs> if a grahastha is not moving into Vanaprastha after having his children who have become grahasthas, you understand? When your children have become grahasthas and if you are still staying as grahastha, society laughed at you. Your pressure, look at this person. And after being a Vanaprastha for some time, if you are not going out for sannyas, they laughed at you, ridiculed, saying, can't give up. What are you holding on? Move. So it was like, sannyas at that time was pure pressure. <laughs> but if I stay here, people are laughing at me, nobody is respecting me. They are looking, what are you holding on? You still here, for what? 
<laughs> Imagine everyone looks at you, you're still here. <laughs> what are you talking about? Why are you still here? You should be in the forest. <laughs> Go. So sannyas was of that kind. So our way of life was Brahmachari, Grahastha, Vanaprastha, Sanyas. We had a most ideal way of life. Everything had a role. When you were a Brahmacharya, you were taught about spiritual and uh, academic together, secular and sacred together. Then you, with that knowledge, you enter into Grahastha Ashram. You have the depth to manage three ashrams and indulge and enjoy life. Balance. Perfect. And people had the depth, they can take up challenges because you were backed with spiritual knowledge. When you don't have spiritual knowledge backing, you are not ready to take challenges. You want to find an easy way out because the mind is weak. If you are strong, then you, you are ready to take up challenges. So three ashramas they could ma manage with a huge amount of children saying, I know we can manage these kids. So it was a responsible and indulgence, pleasure, everything combined. Then you move, withdraw. But staying there to guide. Because there is grandchildren who will, who will connect with the grandparents, Vanaprastha. So it was more like a guide, preparation to move out to sannyas. After some time, like if your grandchildren, if they have become grandchildren, we are still there, there it goes. The society was laughing at you. Saying, look at this man, how old he is. Not able to give up. Like if a teenager is hanging on to toys, you're going to you laugh, right? <laughs> you up, no, why are you holding on to toys still? Similarly, if you're holding on to the world, people laugh. So people said, say yes, go. It's a nice way of life. We may so then materialism is a phase. That can, that can never be the goal. Okay, we are all <laughs> <laughs> uh, When you said Jaspur, you may see how can you do it? You have to do it. To start with, loudly would be easy. Then softly. Then with it. So what is the next program? Three thirty is what? My class? Yes. We'll, we'll, we'll shift it. Let's do it at four. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti.